life hacks. Anybody else like life hacks? You find stuff on the internet. I love them so much, I brought some for you today. If you're watching from home, I don't know if we'll have those on the screens, but here in the room, bonus content. Um, let's put this first one up. This is cool. If you sleep till noon, you only have to pay for two meals instead of three. Winning at life. Brilliant. Let's put another one up. Number nine, if, you, if your car is making an unsettling noise, just turn your radio up until it disappears. <laughs> you don't have to worry about it anymore. Brakes are squealing? I can't tell. All right, and then uh, last one. This is fun. Use this simple tip. You can use this when you go out to lunch today to, to uh, get free meals forever. If your tip is negative the amount of your bill, you owe nothing. Yes. Don't actually do that, especially if you're wearing a North Parkway shirt, okay? Please tip generously. Uh, I, I love life hacks because I want to do things better. I, I want things to go more smoothly for me in life. We are in a series where we're looking at spiritual life hacks from the guy that designed the human race, from the guy who created you and who knows you inside and out better than you know yourself. And so we've been opening up the Bible and looking at stuff from the designer that he says, if you do it my way, things will go better for you. Let me uh, read this passage, and we, we shared this last week, and this will be for every week in this series, John 15, 11, and it goes like this. I have told you these things, Jesus said, I've put these guidelines in the Bible, so that you will be filled with my joy. He said, I, I give you rules, it's not to make life harder, it's to make life happier. It's to make life flow the way that I intended for it to go. And so, we're looking at those one at a time. The thing is, a lot of them show up in places that you wouldn't expect. A lot of these are, I call them happiness hacks, because it's, it's stuff, it's a life hack that I never thought of, but he said, do it this way, trust me, it'll go better. And so I want to share another happiness hack with you today. And this one, before we put it up on the screen, this one is, like if you're going through the instruction manual, this is the one that's printed in red ink with warning and a red box around it. And it has warning in like 17 other languages. So, you, you know, if you don't know any German or any Italian or any French, you just, you know, you, all of these. All bold red ink, watch out, caution, be advised. This comes from Jesus. He says this in Luke 12, 15. He says, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Jesus says, watch out. You need to be on the lookout. This will get you if you're not paying attention. You will fall into this pit if you're not looking out for it. He says, watch out. Life is not about the amount of stuff that you have. It's not about getting enough. Life is bigger than that. Life is more than that. And if you don't watch out, you will believe that life is about getting enough stuff. Now, before we get into the rest of today's talk, some of you guys, I know, have been um, wearied by pastors talking about money and trying to preach money out of your wallet. We already took up the offering today, okay? So just relax, okay? But if you're online, you can still click the link. <laughs> This is not a tithing sermon. This is, this is not a fundraising sermon. This is a, I don't want you to fall into a trap sermon. And if you have notes, you can fill in the blank notes. You can pull those out. I want you to write this down. Loving stuff will wreck your happiness. It will wear you out. It will mess it up. It will actually make it hard for you to ever get it and hold on to it. Loving stuff will wreck your happiness. Now, this is not a message saying stuff is bad. Stuff is not bad. I like stuff. I own a lot of stuff. Some of my stuff is expensive. Some of my stuff I don't let the kids play with because it's my stuff. When you're grown up, you make the rules and I have some, okay, I, this is not an anti-stuff. But loving stuff is bad for you, according to the guy who created this species who designed how your brain is wired, he said, don't fall in love with stuff. Life is bigger than that. Have you ever been misquoted? Have you ever said something, maybe in an argument, and your son or your wife or your buddy, 
they remember a version of what you said, but that's not what you said. It's like one or two words off. It's like, that's not what I meant. Okay? Anybody, hands raised, anybody ever heard money is the root of all evil? Anybody ever heard that? Okay. That is not what God said. That is a bad misquote. That is a election year level misquote. Okay? That is not what he said. Let me show you what he did say because it's important for us today. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of, not all evil. Are you kidding me? Loving money doesn't cause all evil in the world. But loving money causes all kinds of problems to sprout in your life. And Paul says to his, his protege, to this young minister who is a pastor in a church, he's giving him wisdom from his experience through the Holy Spirit, and he said, some people craving money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. Okay? Who would like to be pierced with many sorrows today? Uh, no, no, I don't want that. I want happiness. I want the big, giant, smiley face in my life. Loving money is a problem, and loving money causes your happiness to shrink in life. I love it when this happens. I will always point this out when I can. Um, there are so many times when God says stuff in a book. This letter was written literally thousands of years ago. And modern science says, let's study. And they, they come out with this published result that say, as it turns out, that's actually what happens. It's cool. I like it. Um, several different studies have been done over the last decade on materialism in America. Because let's be honest, of all the cultures in the world, we might be the furthest on the scale of loving stuff. Here is a synopsis of what all of these studies found. People who fall in love with stuff, and that becomes the center of their life, they statistically have lower social and personal well-being. They're compulsive, uh, impulsive spenders. They have increased debt. They have decreased savings. They have higher levels of depression and social anxiety and less general satisfaction in life. Well, that stinks. I don't want that. God doesn't want that for you. He doesn't want you to fall in love with stuff. And let me, let me say this too. Before you mentally shot block this whole message and say, oh, <laughs> this is for rich people. I don't have to worry about that. Okay. I'm just trying to figure out how to keep the light bill on next month. Not my problem. Okay. I know some of you guys. All right. When Jesus says, watch out, don't fall in love with stuff. Your life is more than stuff. The vast majority, and we're talking like 90% of the people he's talking to were poor. They were trying to keep the, well, their version of the utility bill, right? They're trying to keep from getting their farm repossessed. When, when Paul writes to Timothy and he says, you need to tell the people in your church, don't fall in love with stuff. You're going to invite all kinds of sorrow into their lives. There were rich people in his church. There were poor people in his church. There were slaves who literally owned nothing in his church. And he said, you need to tell all of them this is, this is dangerous. Okay? Loving stuff is not a rich people disease. It's a human problem. You can write this down. You don't need to have money to trust money. You just have to think money is the answer or getting more stuff will make me feel happier. It's like this. I, I like, let's put that image up on the screen. I found that this week. Uh, I don't know if some of you guys from your angle, you may not be able to read the bottom. It says, money can't buy happiness, but I'd rather cry in a Lamborghini. <laughs> it might make me a little bit happier. And it's not having stuff that hurts you. It's, it's loving stuff because here's how this works. Right? We know that that some people who have it all, they love what they have. And there are Scrooge McDucks in our country who just love to, if any of you guys remember Scrooge McDuck, I'm dating myself a little bit, who love to just dive into the vault of gold coins and say, oh, I am so happy I'm rich, right? That's what we think of when we think of loving stuff. But I want you to consider this. Okay, don't raise your hand on this because I've been there. If you've ever been so strapped for cash, you didn't know how to make it, and you said, the thing I really need is to just pay this one bill off, and then life will be okay. 
if I could just get a car, life will be okay. If I could just get a better car, life would be okay. If I could finally own my own home and they wouldn't keep raising rent on me, life would be okay. By the way, when you do own your own home, they don't raise the rent. The city just raises your property tax. It's the same thing, okay? okay. It, you don't have to have stuff at all to think stuff is my answer. Stuff is my hope. If I can just get a little bit more, I'll be happy. And what happens is when you fall in love with stuff, write this down, you tie your happiness to it. And your happiness, now I'm going to try to do this without dropping the balloon. Let's see if my Royal Ranger training can hold out here for a little square knot. That's it. Right over left, left over right. When you love stuff, see I have my little green for money um, tag. When you love stuff, you fall in love with it, you tie your happiness to your current amount of stuff. Sounds great if you have a lot of stuff. Sounds great if you just got a raise. Sounds great if you kind of figure out how to turn on the waterworks and dad will buy whatever you need. Sounds great. But it's great in a moment and then it's really not great. How many of you guys ever have this happen? You ever go to AT&T or Verizon and you're like, I need a new phone plan. Oh, actually today we're running a special. You can get the new iPhone 14 for $99. And you say, yes. And you get it and you take pictures and your friends are like, did you just get a new camera? And you're like, yes, I did. I feel good. I'm happy. That uh, stuff makes me happy. And then, ever have this? The next month. The next month. I'm a PC gamer. The moment that you buy a new graphics card, NVIDIA says, oh, next year we're coming out with a better one that has twice the memory bandwidth. And as soon as you get that, all of a sudden, I don't feel so good about my stuff anymore. This is, this is junk. Why do I have this phone? I need the other phone. But they're not running a special on the other phone. And the other phone is more than I can afford. And now my happiness is way down here. I just got a new car. Yes! Woohoo! I live in Illinois and I have to pay to get the license plates for it. No! <laughs> right? And up and down and up and down and up and down you go. Some of you guys, uh, I was just telling the, the crew this morning, I get an email in my inbox every weekday morning with reports on the stock market. Um, I, I have some investments for retirement. I have a, an embarrassingly small amount of Bitcoin that I got years ago. And I always watch, is it up, is it down? I, any of you guys that pay attention to the stock market, what does it do, especially this year? It's up, it's down, it's up, it's down. It's Jerome Powell says, well, we might raise interest rates. <laughs> Just kidding, no, we won't. Okay, oh, it's up. It, and, and for those of you guys who say, I, I, stocks, are you kidding me? All right? Stocks. Uh, the same thing happens when you roll into the drive through line at McDonald's. Okay? Because I, I just need a Big Mac. It costs how much? No, I just need one. Wait, that's the price for one? Can I get a half Mac? If you pull the middle bread piece out, will it save me some money? Because nobody wants the middle bread piece anyway. Why do they even do that? Just... Up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. It's exhausting. And you can never really know what's going to happen next. Maybe that'll stay. That's a bad place to tie your happiness to. And, and I don't know if you've noticed this, but I've noticed this in my own life. When I tie happiness to getting stuff, it's always, it always goes like this. If I could just get that next thing, I'll finally be happy. Okay? It, computer enthusiast computer builders we're famous for this you built you've never finished building your computer it's always oh man if i could just get one more colored light to go inside of this thing right if i could just get a few more flowers and redo this part of my yard if i could just get and and the reality is no matter how much you get there's always something one step further that's a little bit nicer that somebody else got and if i could just get a little bit more i'd finally have enough and, and the sad truth is, it's like chasing the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. You run, 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 run. You never actually get it. 
And if you do actually get it, I don't know if you've noticed stuff, stuff doesn't hold up very well. And when you finally own that home, it needs constant maintenance or else it's, bleh. it's a bad idea. God has a better way. And let me write, write this down in your notes. The antidote for materialism that he gives in here, the answer is generosity. The, the answer to loving stuff is not hating stuff. The answer to loving stuff is being willing to share stuff and not hang on to it so tightly. It, it does stuff in your brain. We'll look at that in a minute. But first, let's look at how he said it. All right. So Paul writes to Timothy, this young guy. He says, you need to watch out and tell the people in your church. Watch out. Don't fall in love with stuff. You'll pierce yourself with many sorrows. And then later on, he says what to do instead. Verse 17, same chapter. Timothy, 1 Timothy 6. He says, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Imagine that. 2,000 years ago, money was still unreliable. It's here today. It's gone tomorrow. He said their trust should be in God who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. You see the happiness stitched in there? He said, tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. And by doing this, doing what? By doing what? By being generous. By sharing with others. He said, here's the hack Here's how you cut through the layers and you fix the problem. He said, by doing this, by giving generously, they will be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience true life. Here again, God's desire is not to make life really hard and say, how high can we crank the hurdles? We, I need to see if, if Michael can get over it or if I can make him smash his face in one. Let's see. Let's ramp up the difficulty level. Right? It's not what he wants. He said, I want them to have happiness. I want them to have enjoyment. I've given them stuff so they can have fun with it. I want them to experience true life. But here's, here's how they need to do it. They need to be willing to share. They need to be willing to be generous. And there are a lot of different ways that you can exercise, you can practice generosity. It, it's, not, it's not all writing a check and just funding a missions program. Okay? But I, I've learned this, studied this in, in um, a graduate class, that many of the most generous people on the planet are some that have the least Sharing is not just, I have a lot of extra. Sharing is saying, I'm willing to give a little bit of what I have because I'm confident that if I do, I'll still have enough. It's something different that happens in here. And there's so many different ways you could do it. You could be generous by helping these kids do their, uh, their state and national fine arts deal. You could be generous by helping Chris Ali and his family uh, have enough to continue doing missions work. You can be generous by giving to Pekin Outreach Initiative or by, by volunteering with the Boys and Girls Club or by helping your neighbor who is aging and has a hard time mowing their lawn and say, hey, let me mow it this time. You can be generous in so many different ways. And here's what happens. Write this down. When you are generous, when you share, sharing doesn't just meet a need. It reduces your dependency. It, it rewires some stuff in here. And what happens, and we talked about this a little bit last fall. Um, some of you guys were here. We, it, it produces this idea in your head that when I have less stuff, I'm still happy, which means maybe happiness is not directly tied to the amount of stuff that I have. I found this out uh, years ago when my kids were really little, back when we were a family of five, and I, like two of them were constantly, were still in diapers, which is, if you have more than one kid in diapers at the same time, God bless you. I know this is stressful because you're like, you know how much diapers cost today? Wow. We, we bought a house that was more than we ended up being able to afford, and we were struggling to get out of it. And every month, looking at the bank account was stressful. It was stressful. 
And we knew we had to get out. And so we went through this difficult process. It was a bad housing market. We finally were able to sell the house and escape with our lives. And we went from a nice big house with a two-car garage and all of this stuff to a small, modest two-bedroom apartment. Uh, and so one of the bedrooms is for, uh, well, it was for Ethan and, uh, and then baby Judah. And, and so we were, I mean, it, it was tough. It was tough. And I had boxes stacked on top of things. And so most of our stuff didn't fit in the apartment. So most of our stuff had to go in a storage unit across town. And at first it was depressing. And then something happened. About three months into that situation, I realized I'm not stressed to look at the bank account anymore. I'm not worried about how we're going to make it anymore. I actually feel okay. And I, I realize, and some of you guys, you got storage. I've got tons of storage now, okay? Maybe I didn't learn well. But it, I went months and months and months without even opening the boxes of the stuff in storage. And here's what happened. I'm not, I'm not making this up, really. I had this moment with the Lord, and I realized, I don't need any of that stuff in order to be happy. I can be happy with it. I can be happy without it. And so it taught me something. It taught me that having more or having less does not mean this has to go up or down. This can be steady no matter what I have. See, sharing does something powerful. When you share, you attach your happiness to a better foundation. You attach it to God's foundation. And he says, I'm going to take care of you and give you what you need. Now, I would love for the Bible to say that God will give me what I want. I would love for the Bible to say, God will answer my prayers if I'm good enough. God will give me the, all the desires of my heart. I wish that verse meant if I can dream it up, he will give it to me. I don't want that verse to mean he will make my desires match up with what he's already given me, so I'm happy. But think about this. Okay? If, if your happiness is tied to getting more stuff, to getting bigger stuff, to getting better stuff, who is it in your life that has to work harder to get more stuff? Me. Me. Who needs to take overtime if they want to get the better car payment? Me. Who needs, to, who needs to spend all weekend fixing their own car because they're wanting to save money for a vacation? And okay, me, me. And once you get stuff, some of you guys, some of you guys have a lot of stuff. You know this side. Once you get stuff, who stresses about the possibility of losing that stuff? Me. All the stress is me. It's me, me, me. If all you need to be happy is enough, do you know who gets the stress over that? God. He said he will give us enough. Verse 17 from our passage earlier. The Bible says that God richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. And if it's his job to make sure I have enough, I don't have to worry about it. He's good at that stuff. But that, that, that can't happen when happiness is having more. Happiness needs to be, I'm comfortable with what I have. I would love to have a newer car. I would love to be able to remodel all of the stuff in my house. I would love to have a newer phone with more megapixels on my camera. But I don't need that to be happy. It's a bonus if I get it, it's great. But God has blessed me so, so, so much already that I have enough. And enough is this bulletproof foundation for happiness that this can go wee up and down and up and down and up and down. And this is not moving because it's tied to a better foundation. So God says, as Natasha comes back up, God says, I have a better way. Trust God. And be generous and share, and it will, you will rewire your brain. You will teach yourself, I don't have to have the stuff. I can still be happy with less stuff, so I don't need more stuff to be happy. Okay? And so, in Paul's letter to Timothy, he says, 
God richly gives us all we need from our enjoyment. And then verse 19, he said, they will be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future. And here's what's cool about storing stuff with God. Here's what's cool about banking with heaven. They have something much better than the FDIC insurance on your banking account. Jesus said, same passage, he said, watch out, don't fall in love with stuff. A few verses later, Jesus said, the purses of heaven never get old or develop holes, and your treasure will be safe. No thief can steal it, and no moth can destroy it. You can have happiness steady and not up, down, up, down, up, down every time they raise prices and you go into Aldi and you cry a little bit when you roll out with your overloaded cart because I don't know. <laughs> okay? Or you have to put back the food you really like and get the, the stuff that you don't really like because you can't afford. Okay? It's not a crisis. It stinks. But it doesn't sink your happiness. The answer is not loving stuff. It's having enough. And here's why it's so important that we don't stop the sermon here. And can I be honest? Younger Chris taught a very similar thing about five years ago. I went back and watched the video and I said, you dummy. You told everybody what to do and you didn't tell them how to do it. Because here's the the problem with human nature. Everything in you is wired to not do this. And to hang on to stuff and love it. Just like Bilbo Baggins with the ring. Okay, some of you guys are Lord of the Rings fans. After all, why shouldn't I keep it? Right? Even when you know you should give it away. Even when you know it's bad for you. Everything in you is wired around. That's why Jesus said, watch out. That's why he wrote this warning in red ink with all caps. Caution. Beware. Everything in your nature because a human society is disconnected from God, right? Because human society wants what's best for you. Everything in you will push back against this. You will fight against this. It's hard, and that means if you want to win, the last thing to write down is this. You need God's help to be generous. You will not choose to do it consistently because you believe it's good for you. And ultimately what happens is being generous means recognizing God's generosity to you. Because when you recognize that he loves you and he's never going to let you go and he's going to make sure that you have enough little by little, tiny baby step at a time, it starts to reshape your heart in the image of the one who made you and you start to grow in trust. If he said, I'm going to have enough then I gradually become satisfied with enough. And I don't have to overindulge to be happy. There's a, uh, there's a traditional Jewish prayer. And if you've ever watched the TV show, The Chosen, you've probably heard this. Okay, it's a Jewish tradition. It goes long, 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 way, way, way back. Every time you eat bread, and still today, God-honoring Jews will say this. Before they eat the bread, they will say... Blessed are you, Lord, God of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Now, anybody ever bake bread? I love making bread. Okay. The bread doesn't come from the earth. The bread comes from the oven, right? But, but God is the source of all of the ingredients. God is the source of my ability to think with the brain and make it. And when I recognize he is the source, it helps me to trust that if he's good and he said I will have enough, I can be okay with enough. And I don't have to stress about what if I can't get more. I want everybody to take your hand. Just take your hand and, and stretch out your fingers and look at it. Okay? Look at your hand. I, okay? Somebody, somebody went through grade school and they're like, okay, oh, yeah, smell your hands and pop. Right? Not that. Not that. Not that. Okay? Look at this. All right? The average adult human hand is, is between about five and a half and eight and a half inches from, from palm to fingertip, okay? See that? The topsoil needed for life on earth to continue is about that thick, on average, across the globe, 
Yeah, you put your hand down. I just wanted you to get the visual, okay? You know how big the earth is? Think about this. Every living thing on the surface of this planet, every piece of terrestrial life is completely dependent on this much topsoil. And if that, Rick, if that topsoil ever failed, we'd all starve to death. You can't make that topsoil out of dust. It's him. He provides what I need. It's only that my greatest achievements are only because he enables me to live on this planet and have success in those. And when I realize God has been generous to me, then I don't have to reach out for more. Because let's be honest. What kind of a statement is, if we, if we really step back, what kind of a statement is that if the God who hung on the cross to bleed for you and came out of the tomb to give you new life says, I've given you enough. And you say, yeah, but I think if I had a little bit more, I would be happy. That doesn't even make sense. This is hard for me. I, I fall back into this so many times, but I don't want you to live with your life on this roller coaster of money. And you don't have to. So let me encourage you to enjoy stuff and to buy stuff and to like stuff, but never to fall in love with it and to tie your happiness to it. Be generous and let him develop a sense of enough and you can have happiness no matter what's in the bank account. Honest. Hey there, just wanted to take a minute to say thanks for watching. If a friend sent you this link, it's because they believe what we talked about today is going to make a positive impact in your life. And if it did, there's probably somebody that you care about who could benefit from it. So take a minute to share this video with somebody, post it to your timeline or send them a direct link. And if you're able, take a minute to give using the link at the bottom of the description on this video. One last thing. Maybe you feel a tug at your soul and you're ready to take the next step in your spiritual life and form a relationship with God. We've got folks here who would love to talk with you about it. So just text prayer to the number on your screen and we'll follow up with you. It's also in the description on this video in case that helps. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.